aspects of animals, such as when they mature, how large they are, their, how many eggs they produce, and so on, and how those then affect population ecology, and then in turn, how that information can be used to uh, inform uh, what we know about conservation. So it's basically going to be a, an attempt to integrate several different fields, and I will be a little bit scattered. You probably got a clue already from... Uh, Tom's introduction that um, what he called diverse you might, refu might view as being rather scattered but I hope I can try to, try to draw it around the general theme uh, in which I want to try to understand the biology uh, and, um, of decline and what people often refer to as extinction risk. I want to uh, see what we can do about testing some criteria that are used for threat listing of species when we say the fish for example is threatened with extinction um, what are the bases for making those judgments? And then ultimately my goal, I guess, is to help to build some bridges between fisheries management and extinction risk or more traditional conservation concerns. And this is an area that a number of people uh, here have been very much involved with as well, where, as you'll see, there's a, there, there has been quite a divide in the way people often think about um, fish species, whether we're trying to manage them to, to sustain maximum yields or whether perhaps we are uh, concerned about them actually uh, not just being overexploited, but potentially actually becoming extinct. So I want to try to bridge uh, some of the different approaches people take to getting at that. So let me just step way back for a second here, just for a moment, and I'll show you the only equation uh, of the talk. Uh, I was always taught it's fatal to put an equation that you lose half the audience per equation and that it's, a, it's sort of a decay curve. So one equation, if you'll allow me, and here it is. This is uh, something we recognize. We are currently at the state where we have human uh, consumption of natural resources driven by our expanding population and especially by our increased per capita consumption of resources in many countries. This consumption exceeds the productivity uh, that the ecosystem is able to maintain. And the fact that uh, this arrow is bigger than that arrow is simply to show you that we are now running an ecological deficit. That's it. That's my equation. This side is bigger than that side, and that is at the root. Basically, this is a root description of where we are. And we all know various aspects of, of how this problem is manifesting itself. Here you see world water withdrawals uh, through time, and including projections. That's not going to stop anytime soon. Uh, world energy consumption, we all hear about all the time, as well as, of course, CO2 emissions and impacts on the, on the climate. How does this manifest itself in terms of how um, habitats are affected? Here is an attempt to compile a couple of studies that have tried to look at global rates of change of major habitats. It's surprisingly difficult to get this information. Remote sensing is making it easier, but it's still very difficult. And the thing I'm, I notice here is that we have a, we're, we're losing seagrass in many parts of the world. Uh, tropical forests, we all know that, that those are not doing terribly well. But look at how badly coral reefs freshwater habitats and mangroves are doing. In fact, arguably, some of these major aquatic habitats are in as much or probably even more trouble than the sorts of habitats that one usually hears about in the press, at least, which would be the terrestrial habitats. So we are feeling it pretty hard now in aquatic types of habitats. And another way to look at this is to look at combined population indices. This is the... Um, Living in Planet Index of um, the uh, Worldwide Fund for Nature. And this is using what are now some fairly good and s uh, sophisticated statistical methods of combining population trends from different species. It's just one snapshot, horribly biased. It has to be because we don't count you know, things like millipedes. There's no global estimate for how populations of millipedes are doing. So, of course, it's biased toward the big things, and we know big things often are not doing so well, but for what it's worth, here, here's, here are freshwater populations, not just of fish, but other things as well, living in freshwaters, and here, here's tracking their trends through time, 28% decline. Um, here are 274 marine populations, invertebrates as well as, as vertebrates, and uh, a fairly similar rate of decline, and here are the terrestrial taxa, of birds, mammals, and, uh, and things like that, which are declining again in a fairly similar sort of manner. The endpoints are surprisingly 
um, uh, similar. Now, I, this is not to say that we really are losing a third of the, the, the we've had a one quarter or one third drop in everything on the planet. I want to be really clear. This is a biased sample. It's probably not terribly representative, but I do think it's interesting to see that we're not seeing a great difference here between the aquatic and the terrestrial types of habitats. Where we get into real trouble is if we try to actually look at things like extinction, especially in the sea, because it's so hard to count things um, in the oceans. And a few years ago, uh, Nick Dolvey and Yvonne Sadovi and I um, did a, a review in which we looked for extinctions, cases of extinctions in the marine habitat that didn't need to be, we didn't have to be just global extinctions, but also including regional extinctions. So, and by extinction, I do actually mean gone, not just collapsed or strongly declined or whatever. This is where there was reasonable evidence that people had looked fairly hard for something and it didn't seem to be there anymore. Okay, it's, it's, it, to the best of our ability, these are actual regional uh, and local extinctions. Now, what would you expect? If you were to plot the date on which something was last seen here, so we published the paper in 03, we had data that went up to 2000 at that point. So here's the potential date of the last sighting and the reporting delay that you could have had. So for example, if something disappeared in 1900, if it was not seen in 1900, the longest it could have taken for somebody to notice by looking at a paper and saying, hey, that thing isn't here anymore, would be 100 years as of the year 2000, right? That, whereas if something had just disappeared, there couldn't be much of a reporting delay. So what all this line is showing is that it's the maximum reporting delay you could have had as of the year when we did the survey in, in terms of how long it might have taken for us to actually even notice that something wasn't there anymore. And so that's the outer boundary, the worst case scenario. What do the data actually look like? They actually kind of hug that boundary pretty strongly here, you can see that, in fact, the median delay, just in reporting something's not there, noticing that it's absent, was 43 years. So in recent times, in fact, if you were to blow this up and look at it another way, in recent times, we've actually gotten a little faster. Things are a little faster, significantly faster in recent times. But it's still a pretty bleak problem when we want to try to assess um, threat status and extinction risk uh, in the sea. And where this really comes crashing into um, traditional fisheries type management, which many of us are familiar with, is when you start looking at some of these, um, let's put some faces to some of these declines. So here's the northern cod. This is a complex of stocks off Newfoundland. And it's had about a, they had about a 99% decline over a roughly 30-year period. A very similar looking shape of the decline of, of stocks of western bluefin tuna. And when you look at these, then compare them with something where people who are worried about extinction risk typically are involved. Let's take something like um, Antarctic populations of blue whales. It's awfully similar. These are not comparable. This is, this is catch rates, thousands caught. So um, th that's the best there were. There are no good estimates. So of course that's going to have some problems with it. But the point is, in all cases, We've got about a 95 to 99 percent decline over 20 or 30 years, and these decline, these rates of change look pretty darn similar. Very few people would would disagree that Antarctic blue whales, as of 61, uh, certainly were threatened with extinction. Um, but many people disagree very strongly that cod and tuna are threatened with extinction. The demographics alone are generally not enough to convince people. And the reason is life histories. Oh, that's one of the main reasons. There's two reasons. One is life histories. We know that blue whales have very slow rates of reproduction. They take a long time to reach maturity. They, don't, they cannot bounce back quickly even if you stop um, hunting them. Whereas, so the saying goes, a northern cod, well, a female cod could have five million eggs. So in theory, a few females could get lucky with their young and the population should be able to rebound a lot more quickly. Now there's a second difference, which is that there are still a lot more cod in the sea than there are whales in absolute numbers. But this would all be a very academic discussion, okay? You're probably wondering why, why do we actually care? Well, the reason we care is because we have a problem of uh, uh, whether what happens when sustainability meets extinction, and I've taken made this a play on the uh, the byline of the Bevan series: uh, sustainability meets reality. Well, in many ways, it can also meet extinction risk because the IUCN, the world body which has been responsible for uh, the global threat status of species around the world, declared in 1996 that the cod, as a species, the Atlantic cod was vulnerable to extinction. 
So this isn't an academic thing. This went down as being vulnerable to extinction. And that caused an uproar in fisheries management agencies, including, uh, especially including uh, Canada, in fact. So the, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans basically said, no way. And I was in England at the time still when this happened, and, and I was very... <laughs> Um, rather embarrassed by my, um, my, the government of my homeland, which came out and threatened the IUCN with all manner of nasty behavior because they said, you have no business sticking your nose in this thing. We're working on it. We have a rehabilitation program. We've reduced the fishing, yada, yada, yada. It, you know, stay out. This has nothing to do with extinction. It's a bit embarrassing if you're the, the stock assessment biologist responsible for a recovery program of a major commercial fish, only to have these, uh, these foreigners come in and tell you the things threatened with extinction, right? So this, this was actually quite a big deal. It triggered a whole series of, of meetings, uh, which I and a number of others were, in, were involved with. Uh, all trying to, to try to help to resolve some of these issues. So let's look at this because this is where some of the biology comes back in. Here, here are these, these dreaded uh, international criteria for extinction risk. So if you, under the, the rules, you, have, you can be vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered. These are, that means you're one way or another, you're, you're badly threatened. And, and the, under the latest uh, heading, under certain situations, you could decline up to 50% before you're declared vulnerable. Okay, 50% in 10 years or three generations, whichever is longer. So those are the rules. So that's the decline criterion. Now you, could, you saw from that graph, clearly the, the cod tripped over that criterion, no problem. It declined by a lot more than 50%. Um, so they're lucky in some sense they got away with vulnerable, but um, that's what it came out as. There's a, but there's a rival set of criteria which are taking into consideration what I said about the fact that you could have very high productivity and you might want to consider that. So for example, um, the... American Fisheries uh, uh, Society broke away from this and said, no, look, you've got to consider productivity. You don't just, you can't compare, you can't use the same types of criteria used to, to analyze whale declines as you do um, a fish. Instead, let's look at how productive they are. And a way to look at that is the rate of population increase, R. This is how fast a population can grow from a small population size. It was a really small value, so the population cannot, even under the best of circumstances, recover quickly, then they say that you could recover, you could decline by 70% before you're vulnerable. Okay, I'm just going to talk about vulnerable here. So 70, not 50. So it's a little harder to get declared vulnerable under the, these rules. And this is for long-lived, slow-reproducing beasties like, like sharks. In fact, if you're a fast-reproducing thing, like a herring-type thing with a really high rate of reproduction, you, de you can decline under these rules by 99% in 10 years before you're even considered vulnerable. Right? I'm not even saying critically endangered, vulnerable. So if you, in theory, you could decline 98% and you wouldn't even worry about it as, as a potentially vulnerable to extinction. Um, personally, I think that's crazy, and, and, uh, but I've had this uh, discussion with a number of the people involved in producing these criteria, and that hasn't stopped them from going ahead and assessing the um, uh, marine fish of, of Canada and the U.S. under these, so these alternative criteria. Needless to say, it's a lot harder to become threatened with extinction if you need to pass that kind of a benchmark if you're a small, fast-growing uh, fish. But the problem is, of course, R, in fact, is a very difficult thing to measure. Everybody who works on this problem knows that. It's hard to know how fast something could bounce back. So there are surrogates allowed. And this is where we go back to my interest in life histories. So, for example... Under the rules, under the American Fisheries Society rules, if you don't know what R is, you could look at the body growth rate, age of maturity, fecundity, longevity. So fecundity, for example, if you only produce, say, 100 or fewer, I can't remember the exact number, but about 100 or fewer young a year like, a, like these sharks would, well, then that would be 70%. So you'd imagine this would say 100. And if it was more than 5 million or something like that, well, then you could decline 99%. So you could use, use things that are easier to get a hold of than this... this sort of um, this very difficult um, population parameter. So Canada, of course, has to be different again. Canada actually sticks to the international criteria. They're not having anything to do with this. Um, they do use the standard criteria. But they also, as with the, the, the uh, fishery society, they do allow for, for you to use sober second thought here. You can look at how, how, what age to mature or body size and moderate your, your, your judgment a little bit. 
So what I want to do is I want to put some of these to the test. Let's take these, let's take three traits. I won't do all these. Don't worry, I'm not going to take you through nine analyses here. Just a couple highlights of some work we've done. Let's look at something like high fecundity and ask, is it really, really related to recovery? And I've got different things we can look at. I'm going to look at, first of all, potential recovery. This is how fast, it's really very much what I just described as R as being, but it's technically not R. It's how fast they, 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 they grow from po small population sizes. But you can also look at actual recovery, which is what happens if you take the fishing off them completely and see what, how they bounce back. And persistence is how long they, they hang on for a given amount of mortality. Let's just look at the fecundity one, because it's one of my favorites. So this is some work we did a few years ago now, and this was our first, one of our very first analyses. Log of fecundity, so um, you need to add lots of zeros after these numbers, but here's high fecundity, low fecundity, and the, the theory would be that if you have a very high fecundity, you're going to have a very high bounce back potential. So we did some analyses with European species, and I'm going to show you a bunch of stocks now. Each data point's a different stock to see if the, the trend goes the right way. And that was the result we got. It actually goes the wrong way. It goes significantly the wrong way. So contrary to the current rules that, that have nevertheless been adopted, um, it turns out that this is actually the opposite. If something is highly fecund, that's actually, if anything, that's a bad sign for its vulnerability. And I know that's weird, and I'm going to tell you in a, little, in a minute or two why I think we got our result. But it, we totally blew that one out of the water, and um, we've been arguing with fisheries biologists and managers about fecundity ever since. There's all sorts, we've looked at this a number of ways. Uh, here's another analysis we did where we take the abundance trend uh, per mortality. So allowing for how hard they were being fished, so you can have negative because you, you, the abundance, um, you know, they might have been fished really hard or not very hard, and that, that affects our metric here. But there's no relationship here. You can't, you can't make anything up here. Um, interestingly, after we got the other result, I realized that some of our, our, our biggest declines were again at the high end, the three data points over here. But the point is it's not, there's no relationship. Um, and so we, we've looked at that. We've looked at the variation in, the, in, the, uh, in, in their recruitment, and that's not related to fun, fecundity. So people who've told us, well, no, it's just that highly fecund fish bounce around a lot from year to year, and you can't get the signal out of the noise. It's not true. There's no more noise in the data if you're highly fecund than if you're not. So I don't think that's it. We've even um, tried this with salmon, where we had better population data. And uh, here we have... Um, variation in, among closely related uh, populations in fecundity, and we, not, we just can't get it. it we never, we'd look at fecundity, and we never get anything with it. So I'm not going to give any points to fecundity as actually being correctly related to saving uh, uh, fish populations. I'll just look at a couple briefly at maturity, though. Here's maturity. Now, that one's working, okay? So things that take a long time to reach maturity do have a low population return rate. And that makes sense. It takes longer for them to, to have their babies. And so this is, this is sensible. And I'm, it's a relief to me. To, after my uh, brush with fecundity, it's a relief to be able to have anything at all to tell you about it. So that's fine. And if you look at actual recovery, we get an embarrassingly significant result with how many data points is that? Don't even count them. It's uh, astonishing. But anyway, it does actually seem to be in the right direction. The, the things that mature late when they're pelagic open water fish, uh, these things um, uh, do indeed uh, take, have a harder time um, uh, recovering, even you know, once you've reduced the fishing mortality. So um, it doesn't always work. It didn't work with our bottom dwelling species, even though we had a bigger range of maturity. So I've got to be careful about that. Body size works better than anything. Okay? Body size, even if you didn't know how its age at maturity, you don't have to know a growth rate. You, actually, it turns out you don't have to know anything much other than how big they are. And that is not a bad fit, uh, if I do say so myself. Um, and so we've got these, the small bodied things uh, are, are indeed have got a higher rate of recruitment um, over time than the, than the big ones. And this is a hint to what happened with that weird opposite relationship we got with fecundity. Because the reason I think highly fecund species didn't have higher maximum growth is that basically it's not as important as things that go with fecundity, such as large size and age of low, late maturity. So if you plot maximum body size against fecundity, those really fecund fish that have got this high fecundity, they're the big cod type things. Think about it, tuna, groupers. Not that groupers are in our, our analyses, but it's the, the large body things ha are very fecund. Small body things have lower fecundity. And we know from theory 
and I hope common sense that, that, that therefore that fecundity itself is expected to be far less important for population dynamics uh, just from first principles than the things that go with it which in this case turns out to be size and age of maturity which is uh, I think the key thing so so really what we have is that these big things are highly fecund fecundity is not relevant to their their population dynamics though it's the things that go with size such as maturity so I've looked at this a number of ways. These aren't all my studies. A number of people have looked at this, sometimes using MPAs and reef fish and so on. And, and we've, we've reviewed this a little bit. And, and it turns out that if there's such a thing as a general rule uh, in fisheries, this might, might be one of them, that in all these places, you tend to find that the thing that pops out of all of the analyses is body size and things that go with it, like age of maturity, when they can measure it. Um, and even there, high trophic level, well, those are large bodied and late maturing fish as well. I'm not saying size itself is the key, and it's not because big fish are being killed more. I, need to, I should have emphasized that. We control for that fact that they're being killed more. It's not that we fish them harder, it's that when you're large bodied, you have late maturity, and therefore your rate of population turnover is lower. I wondered whether it was true for also for freshwater fish. So I, um, since I was in, uh, lived in Europe in those days, I thought I should try to learn something about European fish, and so I compiled a database, and uh, I'll tell you, European fish are not doing well, especially southern ones, down around the, the, the Mediterranean, and uh, really serious problems with extinction risk there, and, and I, I took these, um, we, we, did, we did, we compiled the data for all of these species and all of their life histories, and what I did is I, I made comparisons between members of the same genus, which either were not threatened or were threatened, so they, they when they straddled a, a a, a risk category. So you get a tight comparison. It's like a paired test. So that way I control for a lot by doing this. Uh, we've done a lot of this type of analysis in more complicated ways in my group. But basically, two gobies, right? A goby is a goby to some extent. They're all little bottom dwelling fish in streams and live, breed under rocks, male parental care, etc. And we're simply saying, well, does the one that's got lower risk, is it smaller bodied? Is it, is it in fact uh, smaller bodied? So here's the analysis, and the answer is no. Actually, it's not working here. This doesn't work. Here you've got high-risk species are only just a touch and nowhere near significantly bigger than the lower risk. So unlike my marine case, um, in fact, it's not working. That's what my X means. It doesn't actually hold anymore here in the freshwater scenario. It, uh, we tried it with age of maturity. It's kind of in the right direction, but nowhere near significant. It's just not, it's not a clear pattern there. But there's a problem with this analysis, which is that in freshwater, you tend to have a lot of other things going wrong. In, freshwater, in the marine cases I looked at, fishing was the key problem. It were not big habitat issues with the fish that we looked at. It was fishing, direct mortality um, from fishing. Here, habitat loss is the big issue. As we know, in freshwater, it's very often habitat loss. There were some species that were being fished, uh, but not that many. So if you take out the direct mortality species now, Let's just take them out and look at the analysis just with the ones that are facing habitat problems. Now, in fact, we go significantly the other way. Higher risk species are smaller. And look at how much smaller. They're like half the size of members of the same genus, close relatives that are at a lower risk. So in those paired comparisons, small is bad, not big is bad. It's, it's the opposite. When I do it with age maturity, that, again, that's just not behaving itself. Uh, I don't know if I've got bad data, bad sample sizes or whatever, but I'm not, uh, the pattern simply is not there. But for the thing that is measured most accurately, which is body size, because we know more about how big things are than when they mature, I've got the opposite result. So I wondered if this was just us or whatever, uh, and if you go through the literature, there have only been a few studies like this done, and sure enough, we got the small size, and nobody else actually got large bodied being bad in freshwater fish comparative analyses. It never comes through, unlike the case for the marine one. It's these other things. Look at this. Ecological specialists, ecology, ecology. This is a distributional thing that we picked up. It's other things that have to do with habitat specialization. And if you take out habitat and you're a specialized, um, uh, uh, not a generalist, then it makes sense that you're more likely to have uh, a problem. So what I'm saying is that it looks like when exploitation is the problem, which is true in the sea, it's low life histories, and when habitat loss is the problem, uh, it's not. It's more often things that have to do with ecology and behavior. Now that's not much of a, this is, okay, is that really, you know, maybe it's something to do with the sea and, or something like that. Maybe this isn't a much a very terribly general relationship. So I wondered about other taxa, and, uh, and so 
here's a study that we're, we're just uh, doing right now. I have a PhD student, Sharon Brooks, who's working on Cambodian water snakes. This is the largest exploitation rate of any reptile assemblage in the world. Um, we, uh, have, we estimate that conservatively 7 million snakes are hunted each year from Tonle Sap Lake in the middle of Cambodia. It's a big, big lake, but that's still uh, quite, a few, quite a few snakes. There's Sharon. In, in her element there. We can get these. These are landed just like they're landed in, a, like as if it was a, it, it's, they're hunted, but they catch them in gill nets. It's a deliberate targeted fishery. And we can go in there. You can see a nice assemblage of species here. And we've, uh, we, as in Sharon, has, uh, <laughs> get, get, dives in there. And uh, we, we have a deal worked out with a lady who lets us dissect them in the, her, the, the, on her, the floor of her bamboo hut. And do, we do all the, the work here. And she, they, people keep the snakes. I, I, this could be a seminar. I'll leave it. I'll try to get out of it. Okay, there is a point to this. They, <laughs> um, they're fed to crocodiles, which are kept. Uh, they re take young cro hatchlings and they, they re rear them up and then they sell them for skin. So it's partly for crocodile food and partly for, for um, uh, the big ones that go into a trade for leather. Um, so there is a whole other story here, um, which you can read. I've got a pap couple papers on my website that you can look at. The point is, we've got all these species to compare, and, and the idea was to test whether we could predict which ones were more vulnerable based on life histories. And if you do that, it turns out that our predictions based on life histories and the timing of breeding exactly matched for the seven species in which we had the most data, perfectly matched um, the changes in catch per unit effort that the fishermen told us were happening um, on, on the lake. So we saw about a 70% decline in these species and the rank order of change exactly matched the patterns I've been telling you about when you consider the life, the life histories here. So I think it might be a fairly general phenomenon, and if you really want to go into it, you can look at all these other studies that have been done, all these various case studies. This is just a snapshot of them. I've compiled quite a few. And, and when exploitation, in other words, hunting, is the problem, it's large size and things that go with it, and when it's habitat loss for hoverflies, butterflies, snakes, birds, mammals, it's not size. It's rarely size. There's a size there and there. The rest have these interesting things like um, ecology and so on. Look at that. You see this one, ambush predation. Would you believe that ambush predation significantly predicts the decline of snakes in Australia? And uh, after reading the paper carefully, I did actually, for about four seconds, follow the logic but there's no chance that I can reconstruct it for you right now. So I'm just going to have to tease you with that one by read and shine. You can uh, dig that one up. So if you put it all together, if you do it, match them all up, exploitation, habitat loss, slow, not slow, it's a pretty clear pattern for the aquatic species, and it's just as clear for the terrestrial if you add them in. They follow exactly the same pattern. They're following it, that basically the message is that it really, to predict threat from life histories, you have to consider what the process is. And despite the fact that, that, that fish and terrestrial animals and, and are, are all basically following the same pattern, we do still treat them differently. So I want to come back to where I started with this issue of management uh, concerns and the way we handle um, uh, fisheries and, and fish. In 2004, we had the first test of the new Canadian Endangered Species Act. Canada was very slow to get an ESA going. They finally had one. And under the act, the an independent committee of scientists um, assesses the threat status of species using the IUCN criteria I told you about. And then they submit the list to the Minister uh, of the Environment. And then the minister, the, the default mode is yes, they go straight onto the list and they are protected. But there is a consultation process, which was nine months long, and we knew all, all knew that's in the legislation. But in fact, um, what the, the minister of the day said was that 12 of these species that were handed in uh, required extended consultations okay, before they'd be considered for the list. That is, before they entered the, the, the nine-month waiting, there was this limbo of, not, of extended consultations required. And in the language of the Canadian Parliament, the list was submitted but not received, which is, I think, really cool. But, I, you know, you can just say these things and, and it, it, so it is. So suddenly, 12 species were totally in limbo. They were submitted, but they were not received. And so 
Uh, I, of course, when this happened, um, uh, in fact, this happened just as I was coming to the World Fisheries Congress in, uh, in Vancouver, and a bunch of people told me this, and we quickly scrambled. We got the list together. Turns out nine of these 12 are fish, right? And so um, fi nine of them went into limbo, and nine went straight in, and non-fish, it's nine and three, and all three of the non-fish were also aquatic species, by the way. There was a snail, and I can't remember what the other two were. So, all tw so basically, aquatic species are being treated differently, and fish in particular have a very much lower chance of even going into the Canadian process. And, uh, and so this isn't me just being paranoid. I can even show you the, <laughs> the chances that that was a, happened by chance alone that, that they were, that they were uh, fish. So... Um, so there is a problem here, and um, as, of, as of right now, we've had 12 out of 12 of the birds that were submitted for protection under the Canadian Species at Risk Act uh, have been given uh, legal. This is of the new ones. There were some, a number of species that were grandfathered in. Uh, and so far, we've got one marine fish. Every salmon stock that's ever been submitted has been um, rejected. Um, and the wording is usually to do with overwhelming social and economic hardships or something. It's the same language that the European Council of Ministers uses every year to overrule their own scientists when they call for a moratorium on fishing for cod in the North Sea. And I was thinking I was someday I should just have a little website where I could put the phrase, key phrases down and governments around the world could just take that phrase and pop it into their answers whenever they want to reject one of these things for um, protection. But... Um, perhaps not. Anyway, Canada's not good at everything. Okay, we're good at some things. We're, we struggle. And so do you. Uh, I got brought in. <laughs> this is not good. I, brought, I was brought in to uh, consult on the, listing, the proposed listing of the barn door skate, for, which would have been the first marine fish under the uh, Nature Species Act, because we were doing some work on skates on the other side of the of the Atlantic, and, and so we looked at all these data, and not all these data were available at the time. This is a more up-to-date um, um, index, um, but at the time, we were somewhere, well, the, the meeting was held uh, about 2000, or maybe, maybe it was sooner than that, about 99, and the data went up to about there, and, and I looked at these data in, 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 in the usual way that you do, with, where it was petitioned in, and there were lawyers and everything, and I said, well, in my opinion, I think that this fish... I said, in my opinion, I think this fish has declined, right? That was my, my learned opinion, was that there was a decline in these data. And, and, uh, and of course, we bat, batted that one around, and Ram Myers was there, and it was Ram Myers and, and, his, and Jill Casey who first pointed this problem out and so on. But in the end, after a very long consultation process, and many of you may know more about the story than I do, I hope I'm not being overly flippant, but it came down to the fact that if you do get look carefully here, you see this here? That was uh, an evidence of a sign of recovery. And on the basis of this and some other data, it turned out there were a few more around than people realized it, it was not admitted. It's not given the legal protection. So um, marine fish, you know, we, this problem goes on. Uh, and so one of the, the things I want to do, and this will be the second last sort of aspect of the talk I want to do, try to put some of this together. The question is, do threat criteria produce false alarms? That's the argument, right? Again, right back to the beginning, I said, you know, the cod, can, female cod, you've still got lots of them. Uh, they can be highly fecund. You just can't, you know, you're going to have a false alarm if you say those standard declines that we're all used to are going to trigger threat listing uh, arguments. So, so what, what we did, and, and this was uh, work initiated by a former PhD student of mine, uh, Nick Dolby, who's just, um, just this week actually joined us at Simon Fraser University for a faculty position. Um, we did a study where, which he led, so, uh, in which basically we, we looked at the possibilities. So you could either be threatened or not threatened under standard index that we talked about, IUCN, or you could be exploited within safe limits or outside safe limits. So here's the management, fisheries agency type management approach to, to life, and here's the, you know, the tree hugger conservation approach. Uh, um, um, NGO sort of uh, language here. And the question is, do the threat criteria produce false alarms? Well, there's, there's possibilities here. One possibility is that if, if, the con if conservation, I'm just going to use this in pejoratively both, on both sides, sorry, but if, if, if conservationists, I see, and people say that they're threatened and, and in fact management agencies argue that they're not, that would be a false alarm. Okay? Possibility, though, would be that you'd have a hit where both agree. Right? Yes, threatened with extinction. Yeah, okay, we agree at least that it's threat exploited outside safe limits. 
Whether you want to call that extinction risk, is we could debate. But uh, at least it, everybody would agree that there's a problem. The other possibility is you have a true negative. Everybody agrees everything's fine, not threatened. It's within safe limits. Or you could have a miss. In other words, a threat people miss the fact that these things are being overexploited. Again, I think we could debate the term miss here because these are different things. We're talking here extinction risk. Here we're talking overexploited. This is more extreme. So whether you call that a miss or not. We, we use the hits and misses thing because we, we took this from other information theory. But, but the point is, our, how far off would we be if we took action uh, when people like the threat listers said to do so, rather than when fisheries agencies uh, said we should. And so we tested um, the, uh, the decline criterion of the IUCN. That's that 50% decline I told you about. We did the, um, the uh, AFS one that I've introduced you to, and we did a, uh, this is another IUCN one, uh, which is a, based on a demographic model. Here's the result. No false alarms. Okay. None of these kinds of criteria ever disagreed, said that something was threatened with extinction when, a fish, when the management agencies didn't also say that there was a problem, that it was exploited outside safe limits. We didn't get a single one. These are European stocks, European uh, fisheries here. Hit, here are the positive hits. Um, you can see there's very few in the fisheries society ones. That's because it's much harder to get listed under those l l rules. Um, and you can see the hits are not all that high, but there they are. Here are the negative hits, and as we, everybody agrees that it's not a big problem. Um, fairly, um, well, again, not a lot of variation among them. And there are the misses. <clears throat> Um, you can see that the IUCN decline criteria, the population trajectory, is actually uh, doesn't miss very many, and that's interesting. That's because it, it, many of the models that fisheries management agencies use are also, um, you know, equations. They're, they're demographic models, so that that's fine. Um, you can see uh, lots of misses by the AFS criteria, and uh, and there they are. So those are the numbers of stocks. You can see the problem here, right? That we don't know that we don't have the data to be able to do this kind of population modeling very often, right? It only, we can only do it with 11 stocks. So it, maybe it's a bias group probably, and it's, it's, this is one of the reasons we want shortcuts, such as using life histories. So I don't know, well, I don't know what you think about it. I act, to be honest, I'm of slightly mixed feelings on this. Uh, even, I, I'm an author of the study, and I, and I do, I, I, I'm very keen on the study, keen enough to tell you about it. But I think that we could argue still about whether we're still talking about extinction risk. In other words, it's not to say whether, a, a, a miss is, is really a miss because extinction risk versus overexploited is debatable. But th what I think is really important here is that this is saying that this great divide between management agencies' approaches to, to stock management and the traditional concerns of extinction risk people, we can bridge that to some extent in that everybody actually basically agrees when stocks are in trouble. So the ISN would not be telling you to take action, uh, management action, in any cases in which the managers wouldn't also actually be agreeing that some sort of action is required. So I want to do, just mention one last thing in passing, because it's hard these days not to talk a little bit about the future and climate change. And again, I want to, one final little application of our life history type of, uh, type of thinking. I want to talk just for a, a minute about something we've, we, we did uh, on climate change in European fish. We all know about the climate change situation and, and that the temperatures are going up and that you cannot, the, the, you cannot model. You can get an accurate simulation model to simulate our global increase in temperatures if you include the anthropogenic inputs of, CO, of greenhouse gases. Uh, but, and so this is the comparison of a model fit versus what actually happens. You can't get it if you don't include the anthropogenic effect. So, um, well, well, so I, I think we're sort of moving beyond that debate in, in most arenas. Um, but the effect has been that in Europe, we, decide, we are definitely getting, we're seeing things getting a lot warmer. And so Alison Perry, who was then doing a master's with me, she's now doing a PhD with me, and uh, people from the CFAS Fisheries Lab um, uh, uh, and I, we did a, a study on compared, comparing the range shifts that have occurred. So here you can see winter sea bottom temperatures. At the sea has been getting warmer over our time period. And here are the centers of distribution for just an example of some of the species that we looked at. We looked at quite a few. And you can see that w with winter temperature, you get fairly tight relationships with things moving north, cod, and anglerfish, these are both fished, and snake plenty, which is a tiny little thing that is not fished. 
So it's not just a change in the fishery. You would get it whether we look at things that are fished or not. Now, I'm, this is with temperature. I'm not saying this is over time, because over time, the temperatures shift back and forth. They actually track temperature better than they do time, which is another reason why I think it's a temperature effect and not some shift in fisheries that's driving it. In real terms, we're seeing centers of distribution moving quite a long way over that 25-ish that year, year time period. Not in a unimodal way, but but back and forth. And if you look all together, we had nearly half of 36 species did move significantly, and all but two of these species have gone north. Now, let me just look at the exception. This one really bothered us. This is the Norway pout. It's a little a bottomish dwelling uh, member of the cod family. And these are northern fish, and these, these creatures uh, came south in our, over our time set, and that was um, awkward. <laughs> and um, and we, we uh, but a chance conversation actually that Allison had with Keith Brander, um, uh, who a, knows a lot about climate and, and, and the North Sea more than we do, he pointed out that because of the way the currents work and the depths, in this particular part of the North Sea, it's actually colder down here than it is up here. So actually these were, are actually an exception that, that helps match, match the rule. They're actually making the right move. We also looked at depth and often if they didn't go south they went into deeper water. Our other exception I can't explain except by arm waving. This common sole has shifted its center of distribution south. Um, we don't really know why. One possibility is that it's because the Thames estuary has cleaned up considerably uh, over this time period, and this is a major, there's a major spawning ground here. So perhaps the population is simply growing in the south, but I don't really know. Overall, look at some of these distances here. These fish are really, really um, moving some pretty big distances here. We're getting quite quite large uh, distances move, move north. And this is all going on while fisheries agencies and the fishermen themselves, I mean, I'm sure the fishermen had some idea about this, of course, but the, uh, th this is certainly not being accounted for in any of the, the recovery plans for things like cod. And there is a life history connection, which is the main reason I'm, I'm telling you about it, that we can actually, for the first, this is the first study of any, any species in climate change in which we could find a clear life history connection uh, a biological predictor of these, these movements. And indeed, the shifters are much, much smaller bodied and uh, earlier maturing than the non-shifters. So I think what we're seeing is a demographic response that species with an earlier age at maturity are able to respond more quickly with their populations and with, uh, to these changing conditions uh, than these non-shifters. Most of these species are migratory. I don't think it's that they can't get where they want to be. It's probably more to do with their ability to, um, to shift uh, their distributions in response to the change. And in real terms, we're looking at pretty big distances that things have been moving compared to a very large review of terrestrial birds, alpine plants, and butterflies that was published um, uh, uh, just a, a couple of years ago. So it's a pretty, pretty strong uh, movement. So I guess I'll, let me try, I'll conclude then um, telling you where I think this kind of work fits into um, one of the sort of the larger scheme of things in terms of the way we respond to population um, issues. Normally, the way, that, the way I see life, you have a pressure, an identified pressure on the environment, which may af affect individuals or their habitats. Okay? And We've seen the cases of both, the freshwater fish with habitat problems, and, and uh, we've also seen in direct selection on them uh, through fisheries. Now, the effect that this actually has on their population, okay, the population response, depends on their life histories and their behavior. They may be able to take it, they may not be able to take it, and that depends on things like age at maturity. It does not depend on fecundity, it depends on, but it, and it may also depend on things like habitat specialization and what, uh, depending on what the specific threatening process is. So life histories and behavior um, cannot be ignored if we want to understand population responses. They, ma they, they basically uh, take this pressure and determine whether the thing uh, goes up or down. Now, when you have a population response, if it's a negative one, that, of course, puts pressure on people. People get, um, uh, get in trouble. Their livelihoods may depend on it. Their lives may depend on it in many parts of the world. Um, or they may simply be concerned that they're losing uh, some aspect of their natural ecosystem. That, of course, then puts pressure on people for conservation management, which, if you're lucky, will start to reduce some of the conservation management. And so some of the studies that we've been seeing have 
been trying to also then try to co cover some of this zone here where we um, who are looking at evolutionary ecology sort of approaches can look at status, biodiversity indicators as we did, and, uh, and then also ultimately inform these management options which will hopefully reduce some of these pressures. I think that we're at the stage in fisheries now where it's kind of interesting where for the past roughly 15 years we've had conservation NGOs, Worldwide Fund for Nature, uh, Greenpeace, all those sorts of groups starting to infiltrate now into a dialogue which normally happened primarily between fisheries agencies and the fishermen themselves. And now with all of this input now of, of NGOs and other individuals who are concerned about wider ecosystem issues and so on, um, it basically the, the whole dialogue has, has expanded and it's had some rough points such as the, this argument that's going on about whether you could really make a cod go extinct or not. Um, I would hope that if we um, can do a little more of, of these sorts of researches to try to ask what sorts of aspects characterize collapses, combine that then with the dialogue such as we're trying to have through our hits and misses analysis, we, uh, it turns out that this divide is not nearly so large and as long as people can clarify what their, their objectives are more clearly, then I actually don't think we have uh, anywhere near such a big problem as much of the rather uh, controversial literature would suggest to us. So thank you very much and happy to answer some questions. Yes. Yeah. No, we haven't, and, and it's a good point. And um, certainly, um, I'm trying to think how many species you can actually do that for. That, I guess, would be our issue. But do you mean survive, say, well, basically to some life stage where people can actually measure it? Um, and and I, we haven't done it, but I know the answer is going to be, which is that these, uh, which I think you know, all of us, anybody who's sort of trained in, 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 in ecology would agree, which is that these, these, the reason these fish have evolved high fecundity is because they exploit unpredictable environments in which the rate of gain per unit investment into an egg is, is quite small. There is, there, there is very little to be gained by that. If they happen to find themselves in a patch of high food quality, then they do well. But they're basically bet hedging. They're producing many eggs over a very long lifespan. And so I think what we, were, we would find, I'm, presumably, would be that the rates of mortality are going to be very, very high for these highly fecund species. Um, and that, uh, you know, the, the basically the bottom line is that fecundity did not evolve in order to protect fish from us. The fecundity evolved in order, the high fecundity evolves in order that they have many kicks at the can over a very long lifespan. If we can track that lifespan, if we fish out a large percentage of the cod, for example, after they reach age two or th three, which we do, well then, of course, the cod lose that reproductive potential over their whole lifetime, which is very important. Yeah. I think it's a relation to the really interesting between sort of life histories and the threat of extinction or the realization of that. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you could talk about for a second whether there's any sort of population biology metrics that indicate to you that a population is in decline. I mean, we often have to talk about whether their life history puts them at risk of overfishing. Yeah. Time. I mean, what are the, what is actually realized? I mean, what is an indication in the population biology of the species when it is truly like on the brink of on the brink of extinction, okay. Yeah, so it's easy to say if something's declining. Well, many, many fish, it's easy to say if we have, especially if there's a, if there's a fishery and, you know, survey data, fish, uh, fishery independent survey data. Uh, to say things are actually on the brink of extinction, um, most of those rules that I've, I mean, we haven't done an explicit analysis of it, but thinking through our table of, of cases of local extinctions, and I am talking local extinctions rather than global ones, because there are, there are very few marine fish that have become globally extinct. Um, but looking at those local extinctions, most of those fish uh, have one or more of those traits of late maturity, um, large body size, uh, also, and as well as suffering more direct mortality, such as going through a bottleneck you know, where they can be caught readily. So at least at the local scale, I'd say that those are the, those, these traits work at a local scale. In other words, I guess what I'm saying is that what predicts population decline on a large area also appears to my eye, at least, to predict a disappearance over a small area. But the thing that we should remember, and I hope I didn't, I don't, it's good that I'm remembering to, to, to tell you this, that 
one of the problems we have, it's not a problem, it's a good thing, <laughs> is that uh, no commercially exploited fish species has ever become globally extinct. That has not happened. Okay. So, um, and this is an argument that fisheries um, biologists can quite rightly use to argue that, that they might be extinction-proof, at least at a global scale. I mean, it's a little... I don't believe that they're any different from any other animal, but because they have large distributions and large numbers, uh, it is actually difficult to make something like the Atlantic cod go extinct at, across its entire range on both sides of the Atlantic. But that hasn't prevented us, of course, from bringing it down to, to very small numbers from which it is not recovering in reasonable time. Yeah. I haven't looked at it explicitly, but I would agree with you, and that's certainly the case for terrestrial taxa. There have been lots of terrestrial species where, in general, large-bodied animals have larger ranges, which is good for, on the extinction side, but low densities. And, and so that doesn't protect them. There's a, this, this, these traits, uh, there have been a number of recent studies in mammals showing very much that um, large size and late maturity is a very good predictor of extinction risk. Um, so. So we haven't done an explicit analysis, but it's certainly true that, that, that a lot of these large-bodied fish, uh, and we ha actually we have done explicit analyses for the sharks and rays, that the large-bodied fish um, definitely do have um, very large, very large ranges usually. Yeah, yeah Andre. Yeah, a lot of people have said that IUCN criteria really don't take life history into account. I think you sort of imply that. <coughs> generation time yep. and scalar captures a lot of the kind of biology that like the AFS tried to capture implicitly. As soon as you scale by generation mm -hmm. time, by definition, you're looking at shorter amounts of time for um, shorter fostered animals, basically. Mm -hmm. And sort of just seeing your plots, I wonder, have you actually looked at the implicit thing underlying IUCN, which is decline rates and generation time? So generation time integrates the candidate natural mortality side, all those good things. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, a good point. And and I totally agree with you uh, that IUCN does is a very clever thing to scale it to generation time. That does capture a lot of the life histories, and this is an argument I've used you know, when arguing against the um, practicality of the uh, American Fishery Society's alternative criteria. So uh, you're right. Um, I'm trying to remember whether we've ever done generation time. Um, we have certainly tinkered around with it. I don't think we've ever published anything on it. The, our problem is that, that that will, of course, reduces our sample sizes greatly for the number of fish for which you could do it. But that's not a reason not to do it, because one of the things I'm quite keen on is that you take the best studied species, see what the rules are, and then try to apply them then to the ones for which you know less about them. So, um, so. Yeah, off the top of my head, I can't think of a, of a case where we've done it. I know we, we certainly had, did tinker around with it. We have tinkered around with that in the past. Yes? Yes. Um, I don't remember whether we looked at that explicitly, but the, the answer is certainly yes to that, that, that we don't notice. I, I suspect there are many other th smaller things that could disappear without people still knowing about it. Um, on the other hand, many of these smaller things might be, of course, inherently less likely to be vulnerable unless they're strongly habitat associated. So, um, um, but yes, I, I agree that it's... Uh, Normally, where these came from would be that somebody there would be a series of surveys over a number of years of some sort. Um, in the case of coral reefs, it would be people snorkeling or diving. In the case of there could be trawl surveys or whatever. And then, with hindsight, someone would look back and say, "Hey, you know what? We're no longer getting something that people got 20 years ago." And that's how Ram Myers discovered the the dis disappearance or the strong decline of the barn door skate. He saw a report, I think it was a, um, 
uh, an American report, a fisheries uh, report, which mentioned in a list something called the barn door skate. And he said, barn door, I'll bet that's big, as in big as a barn door. I wonder how it's doing. Literally, that is how he found out that because, you know, we, these things go out of sight and out of mind. And, you know, the poor New England fishers, when, this, when they're faced with this, they said, well, you know, we've we never even seen a barn door skate. And, of course, well, that's because, you know, their parents got them all. But, um, you know, so that we do, we definitely are, you know, this is the, I'm just giving you a sense of how we, we discover these things. So with that kind of serendipity involved in these things, uh, you know, I think we're, we're bound to be missing the smaller things, the less conspicuous ones. Yeah. Yes? So, so can you re repeat that? Well, under fishing pressure, I mean, with a lot of species, there's been um, evolution of busy earlier maturation. Yeah. So this idea that really that life histories are kind of evolved to be more resilient mm -hmm. in the face of pressure. Yeah. Which makes a lot of sense, given what you're saying. It also seems like then, uh, the harder you push a fish stop, under this idea, you have basically more resilient extinction. Yeah, I, I would like that to be true, I, and and I certainly think that the I'm quite convinced that the selection pressures and the, that we're imposing, combined with the genetic variability in 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 these types of life history traits, are sufficient that uh, that there is bound to be significant evolutionary impacts of of, of fishing. Uh, I have no problem with that, and I think that anybody who argues otherwise uh, would need to have a sort of a specific reason to argue against it. I think that's kind of the, to my mind at least, I feel that this is pretty, kind of almost has to be the case uh, in many, for many traits. But um, I don't think a lot of these things are going to be able to evolve fast enough. That's my concern, especially that has a long generation time. They just don't have time to tick through enough generations to keep up with us. I think that's the, the issue. Um, but um, you know, the, certainly these evolutionary, if they are evolving earlier maturity, for example, then they must be doing that because that's an adaptive trait under the new selection regimes, and therefore by, by extension I would assume that must be uh, a beneficial thing that, you know, that, uh, from a population perspective. Um, so um, that, may, that may help. We've done some analyses in the North Sea, which we have published, where we've looked at, we've looked at the whole assemblage. Of, we looked at very large assemblages going, dating back to early surveys back in the 20s. And you know we are seeing we're seeing the kinds of life history shifts not within species but in the overall assemblage of what's being caught you know going down in perfect you know as you would predict that with now the mix of species being caught today has far more early maturing species in it than um, than um, earlier than, than the earlier time series and so we're basically seeing you know that same type of effect uh, in a life history sense and so you talk about fishing down the food chain. Um, we are definitely fishing down the life histories and any kind of evolutionary effect that we're getting I mean, this is happening in spite of that in other words so. <clears throat> yes Yeah, it's a, it's a good question of what happens to the, the prey when the large fish decline. And uh, to be honest, that's not really something I know a great deal about. I've not really gone into the sort of trophic world very, in very much depth. There may be people here who can, ident who can answer that better than I can. Um, uh, I know certainly people have looked at that. I can tell you a, a short, the best I can tell you is that recovery is often difficult to predict. It can be idiosyncratic. Um, and so, for example, you know, in the um, in, in the Atlantic, in, in you know, off Nova Scotia and, and the, the shelf off that area, we're we're not getting recovery of some of these large uh, bottom-dwelling fish, such as cod, in the way that was predicted. And whereas, on the other hand, um, a number of things that they used to presumably prey on are doing quite well. And perhaps even we have a you know a circle going on where the 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 invertebrates that they used to feed on are now uh, so numerous that they're now feeding on the juvenile cod. These are the kinds of speculations we get. So I guess what I'm saying is I think it can be quite, the, the extent of my knowledge on that subject is to tell you that I think it can be quite complicated. I don't think we tend to get straightforward um, uh, effects like that 
in part because generally with, with fish, you know, they, they change, they go through several different orders of magnitude of prey size that they eat when they, from the time they're born until they're big. So things are all, a lot of, there's a lot of eating of each other going on in very complicated food webs. It's not the simple linear types of cascade that you might predict that you get, for example, in northern freshwater systems and things like that. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right.